Hello everyone and welcome to our very last lecture in the herpetology portion of FNR 24150. So thus far in the semester we've talked about the taxonomy of amphibians and reptiles, we've talked a little bit about their natural history, we've talked about their ecology, and we finished up talking about their conservation. So one of the things I thought I would do is share with you the model that I've developed over the last 13 years using the Eastern Hellbender as a model for amphibian conservation. And, and hopefully you'll see that it encapsulates everything, all the approaches that we've talked about in, in class this semester. That process is encapsulated in the Hellbender project that I'm gonna go over with you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can focus on the slides as I walk you through uh, last 13 years of Eastern Hellbender conservation here at Purdue University. So as I mentioned, uh, this Hellbender project started back in 2007. And much like you've heard me say throughout the semester, you have to understand the natural history, you have to understand the biology of the species if you're gonna be making proper management decisions. So I broke our Hellbender conservation program down into four different phases. And let's first focus on phase one. And from the title of these, uh, components, you can see we're focused on survival, spatial ecology, how animals are interacting with themselves, how they're interacting with the environment, how they're spaced and distributed throughout the environment, what the population size assessment uh, reveals, uh, any, any um, differences in the way we sample to discover uh, hellbenders, which would again affect the population assessment, overall health, and the genetic uh, health of, of hellbenders. So again, this is me going back and saying, what do we know about the life history traits of hellbenders, at least in Indiana? And if, once we obtain that information, how can we start manipulating the, the population and hopefully start restoring the population and, and reestablish it so that it's removed off the endangered species list? So these are the three phases that I've been working on over the past 13 years. And I'm gonna come back to phase four at the very end of the presentation. But I kind of want to, again, walk you through how a really comprehensive conservation program is initiated and, and what it encompasses. Now, oftentimes when I'm in class, I ask the students what they want to do in terms of their profession once they graduate from Purdue in forestry and natural resources. And the majority of the time, the students raise their hand and say they want to be in conservation biology or a conservation biologist. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands how broad conservation biology is and really comprehensive conservation biology programs encompass many components. Obviously, it's got a research component. Uh, sometimes it has an education and outreach component to educate the public about the conservation efforts that are being uh, deployed. Obviously, there's a management implication that you're going to be managing for the species that are that are to be conserved. And oftentimes a spinoff of that is as a captive breeding. And so there's four large components that make up a really comprehensive biology or conservation biology program. So if you take those four components, and here is an example of my hellbender partnerships, we have captive rearing, management, education, and research. Now, obviously Purdue in my lab plays a huge role in the research work that's being done on Eastern Hellbenders, but we also have a hand in education, management, and captive rearing, as are all the various partners. So when I started this program back in 2007, it was the Department of Fish and Wildlife with IDNR and Purdue University. And I recognized early on that if we're gonna try to repopulate an entire species throughout the state of Indiana, it's gotta be um, involving more partners than just the DNR and Purdue. And so I started reaching out to zoos, different universities, different uh, organizations, different Department of Natural Resources and different states to build this comprehensive Hellbender partnership team. And that's what you see represented here in this figure. So these are all the players that get together on an annual basis and discuss the conservation of the species moving forward. We actually get together twice a year once in the spring and once in the fall where all the partners get together and we talk about various issues. And then we've developed action teams. So we have some of our partners are really focused on maintaining and managing for habitat for hellbenders. Others are really focused on education and outreach. Others are fully engaged in captive rearing and breeding. And we have a slew of vets on board that are interested in helping us maintain uh, proper animal health. 
throughout the entire program. So let's talk about the research and trying to understand the natural history. So the very first thing we had to do with this conservation program is to understand the resource that we had. How many hellbenders do we have on the landscape and how they distribute it? So we surveyed uh, the same sites that the Department of Natural Resources have surveyed since 1998. And you can see since 1998, with the exception of one year, hellbender populations have been in decline. And my team came on board in 2007, and you can see since that time, hellbenders have continued to decline at those same survey sites over the last decade or so. The next thing we wanted to do is evaluate the overall health of the hellbenders that we did capture. So we captured 88 in that two or three year period, and we assessed everything that we could imagine. So we did a bunch of blood work, the same kind of blood work that you do when you go to the doctor. We assessed sperm, we assessed the, the, the health and the, the weight class and the, and the status of the hellbenders. Every aspect that we could imagine, we wanted to see if our hellbenders were indeed healthy. We also then, put radio transmitters inside the body cavity of our hellbenders and we followed them around using radio telemetry to understand what habitats they were using, how large their home range sizes, how much they were interacting with other hellbenders. And we learned a lot about their habitat. So this is all different frequency classes of the different types of rocks that they were using uh, throughout the habitat. This is a great figure showing the home range size of a hellbender. So these green dots here represent one hellbender and how much he or she moved throughout that entire two year period that he was being tracked. Uh, this red dot is a separate individual that shows the maximum movement of one individual and how much this individual acted, interacted with the other individual. So for the majority of the two year periods, it was separated, it was, it was together for a very short period of time and then went back to its home range. So what we learned from our spatial ecologies, hellbenders were very rare, they were distributed almost randomly across the landscape, and there was very little interaction between hellbenders. In fact, if you look at the population density, and densities in hellbenders are, are reported as a number of individuals per 100 square meters of surface river. So you can see the density of hellbenders in Indiana was 0 0.06. And if you look at the population densities of hellbenders across other areas of the country, were two orders of magnitude lower than any other location that has been reported in, in the country. So hellbender population in Indiana are certainly uh, struggling. They're certainly very rare. Their densities are incredibly low. And again, individuals are not regularly interacting with each other. And in fact, we haven't had successful recruitment or reproduction in Indiana since 1988. Okay, so it's been a long time. We have received a few nests here and there but those nests never hatched and we never got any larvae from those nests. So again, no recruitment. The next thing we wanted to do was we wanted to assess the survivorship of our population. If we just leave them alone, what can we expect their annual survival to be? And we, we see from our, our adult hellbenders that their average annual survivorship is about 80%. And remember, we've talked about some of the survivorship curves and some of the tables that we've talked about in our lectures. And you can see right where hellbenders fit in those tables uh, that we've talked about in our other lectures in the class. We then moved on to assessing the genetic health. So we know the survivorship, we know how they move, we know their physical and biological health. What about their genetic health? So we embarked on a huge project where we sampled in 10 states, 70 rivers, and we collected 1,200 hellbenders from across this hu huge section of the eastern United States. We did all of our genetic analysis, and what we found is there are two genetic clusters of hellbenders. There's one that follows the Ohio River drainage, and another one that follows the Tennessee River drainage. So within the Ohio River drainage, that means that hellbenders in Indiana are very similar to hellbenders in Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. So if we have to do reintroductions, or if we have to get eggs, we now know where really viable source populations exist. So we really wouldn't want to go to, to Tennessee or North Carolina and try to get hellbenders because they're starting to genetically diverge and may not be the best source populations to repopulate Indiana. So this genetic study was incredibly useful and insightful to, again, instruct us where we needed to go to get new individuals to repopulate. 
So at this point, we felt like we had a really good understanding of the natural history of hellbenders in Indiana. So we started one of, we've started focusing on phase two, which is recovery strategies. So we conducted a, a very large population viability analysis, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We started looking at various management strategies, captive rearing and release, and also translocations, moving those isolated individuals from location to location to see if we can get them to stay in those locations, both as adults as well as juveniles. So let's first talk about our population projection, our population viability uh, analysis. And you can see on the y-axis is the population size, the x-axis is the year. And what this curve is telling us is that if we did nothing in the state of Indiana in 26, 27 years, population hellbenders become extirpated in the state. So we're now, at this point, when I made this graph, we were 11 years in. We're now 13 years into this research and this project. So at year 11, it was predicting that we would see about 30 hellbenders in the state of Indiana. And actually, we found 33 when we did our last survey in 2011 and 2012. The most recent survey was conducted two years ago, and we found five. Five hellbenders, and all of them were male. And so the situation is pretty dire. And so this population viability analysis also indicates which segments, which portions of the population are most effective to help repopulate and reinvigorate a population the quickest. And what the model suggested is we really need to focus on juveniles. And so this graph is showing on the wet y-axis the probability of extinction in years again on the x-axis. So if we did uh, increase the juvenile survivorship from close to 1% up to 10%, we could stretch out our probability of extinction from 26 years, which I just showed you in the previous graph, to about 35 years. If we increase it to 20%, probability of extinction goes to 60%, which is great. But if we can increase it to 25 or 30%, we can almost um, completely reverse the probability of extinction with hellbenders, at least extirpation in Indiana, to near zero if we can reach this 30% survival of our juveniles. So we started thinking, well, what can we do to increase that survivorship? And we've talked about what is the number one cause of mortality and herptofauna? Predation, right? And so when these hellbenders are laying their eggs, their eggs are getting consumed by crayfish, by fish, uh, and heavy, heavy predation on these eggs. So if we can get these eggs from a really delicate, sensitive stage to a two or three year old hellbender that can elude most of those predators, we should be able to increase survivorship when we release them back into the wild. So that's exactly what we tried. We tried two things. We wanted to investigate if we moved adults and translocations from one location to another, how would it affect their survivorship? How would it affect the way they use their, their habitat? And how would it affect how they interact with other hellbenders? Simultaneously, we collected some eggs from the wild. We reared those juveniles in captivity. And again, we wanted to see if we can increase their survivorship once we release them back into the wild. From our adult translocation uh, project, what you're looking at here, these polygons, all these different polygons that you see represent different hellbenders that are now in this habitat. So we, were, we put 10 hellbenders in a habitat where there already were 10 hellbenders. And the very first thing that we noticed is their home range size where it's nearly cut in half. And the home ranges of our hellbenders are overlapping with other hellbenders almost exclusively, right? So complete overlap. In other words, these hellbenders are interacting with each other almost on a daily basis, especially during an important time of the year, which was the breeding season. As soon as we conducted this translocation, we got two clutches of eggs in Indiana, which was really exciting because we hadn't seen that in about six or eight years. How did that affect the survivorship? If you look at the top square, you can see the post-release uh, survivorship of those individuals that we moved. And remember, before hellbenders were ever touched or managed, the survivorship was around 80%. And our survivorship of our moved individuals, our translocated individuals, was 78%. So it really had no impact on the annual survivorship of adults. But what was really exciting was the survivorship from our juveniles that were released. Remember our PVA suggested if we could get it to 30%, we could prevent extirpation of hellbenders in Indiana. And we were really excited to see that we were able to have 50% annual survivorship. 
Now, the next phase was really focused on outreach and education because we've had anecdotal reports that hellbenders were persecuted historically in Indiana. People didn't understand them. They didn't know what they were. There were a lot of misconceptions where people thought they would electrocute you if you touched them. They thought that they were venomous or poisonous. If you touched them, you, you might die. And other ideas were that they ate all the game fish in, in a particular stretch of river as well. And so what we didn't want to do was repopulate hellbenders in the state of Indiana only to have their persecution rates respond and be elevated because people didn't understand the importance of hellbenders, what they were, how they functioned in the ecosystem and just how unique they are to this part of the country. So we did a bunch of survey work with riparian landowners in that watershed and trying to understand how aware they were of hellbenders, what their attitudes were and what behaviors they may uh, exhibit toward hellbenders if they were to encounter them. So we got feedback from all those landowners, about 1,500. We then started to build an outreach and education program from scratch. So we call it the 3D model. We developed the portal, we designed the content, and we delivered the programs, and we evaluated the impact. And we first thing we did was create this website called healththehellbender.org. If you've not been on there, you should get on there and check it out. There's some really great information about hellbenders on this, on this website that we maintain. We then started creating some content for the general public. We created posters, uh, brochures, how zoos were now helping with hellbenders. We created a bunch of stickers to give out to, to various programs that we gave. And unfortunately, I'm not in person to see you guys because every year I always bring my hellbender stickers to class and I give those to the students in the herpetology class. So if you're interested in getting a hellbender sticker, just send me an email through Brightspace or uh, through Purdue's email. And if there's enough people that are interested in getting a Hellbender sticker when you come back to campus in the spring semester, I'll, I'll cut a bunch of those uh, just like you see here and I'll put them in an envelope outside my office door and you can swing by at your leisure and, and grab some Hellbender stickers for your laptop or your, your water jug. Happy to do that. We also created a bunch of videos because uh, YouTube is king in terms of how people get their information. So we created a tremendous number of YouTube videos on how to identify an Eastern Hellbender versus a mud puppy with a very successful video. Uh, we created some music videos for Hellbenders, how farmers can help uh, work with Hellbenders and, and maintain water quality. So lots of different, we, we did YouTube videos with our partners that are the, the zoos, did all kinds of YouTube videos. We also wanted to create curriculum that teachers could use to teach uh, K through five and actually middle school students all about hellbenders and again their importance in the ecosystem and how they're really great indicators of water quality. So all kinds of different types of lesson plans, formal education programs that teachers could use in the classroom. We've uh, within the last two or three years we started partnering with Indiana State Parks. So you can see these 12 or 14 state parks in the southern half of the state are now delivering hellbender programs to the, the patrons that visit uh, each of those state parks. And so now we're, there's thousands of people in the state of Indiana that are learning about hellbenders that probably had not heard about them before. So we're really excited about our partnership with Indiana State Parks. We've built museum exhibits and zoo exhibits. So if you've been to the Indiana State Fair, you may have seen this really large, this is about a 30 foot long hellbender. And, and it's got an interactive game on it um, that really helps people learn about the importance of hellbenders in the ecosystem as well. We that we created a, a game called Hellbender Havoc. So if you get on your app store and just search for Hellbender Havoc, you can download this game for free. And the whole concept is again to educate people on the different life stages of hellbenders. So you get to be a hellbender uh, and you see different hazards, whether it's an angler, there's pollution, uh, there's predatory fish. Uh, but you also get an opportunity to grow. So you start out as a little larvae and you're migrating through a river and you're trying to consume crayfish, uh, stay out of polluted areas and, and, and try not to get caught by an angler and eventually try to grow into an adult. And I'll be very transparent. I have never ever made it out of the juvenile stage. My son can get from a, a larvae to an adult in about three minutes and I've yet to get past the juvenile stage. Clearly I'm not a gamer. So I'd encourage you guys to go through and, and download the Hellbender Havoc game. And in fact, if you download the Hellbender Havoc game and play it and take a screenshot on your phone and email that to me, um, you might get a small reward in doing that. So I would encourage you guys to take a, take a gander at that, play the game, take a picture of your screenshot and send it to me. 
We also created a bunch of uh, trading cards with our zoos. So we have four zoos in Indiana. We have the Columbian Park Zoo. We have Fort Wayne Children's Zoo, Mesker Park Zoo, and Indianapolis Zoo. And so we created trading cards that, that people can pick up and, and collect as they go to the various zoos. And on the back of the, it, on the front of the card, it talks about the natural history and what people could do to help hellbenders. On the back of the card, it tells what that particular zoo is involved with, with hellbender conservation. Now, of course, we have a social media platform. I really encourage everyone to, if, you, if you're on Facebook, to, to drop a like on the Help the Hellbender. So if you just type in Help the Hellbender, you'll see it come up on Facebook. I think we've got about 5,000 followers on Facebook, and I'd love our students who are educated now with Hellbenders to be part of that audience as well. So again, I encourage you to, to get on the Help the Hellbender Facebook and, and drop a like. And if you send me a screenshot of that too, you might be rewarded. We have a face, we have a, I believe this is Twitter as well as Instagram. Uh, so if you're a big follower of either Twitter or Instagram, again, join the Help the Hellbender and you can follow what, what's going on with regard to Hellbender conservation, not just at Purdue, but across the country. So we wanted to see how all this outreach and education that we've generated. So Purdue is the, the largest generator of outreach and education materials. And we wanted to see how it was being used. And we found out that 25 organizations, six states and federal agencies, eight zoos, 11 universities are using our curriculum. Uh, about 63% are using a monthly, 82% follow us on social media and 81% are always referring other people to our social media. So I, I strongly encourage you to, to join that social media and, and kind of keep up. If you're interested in conservation, biology, it gives you an idea of, of what we're doing. So something that I just wanted to share with you, we did a really cool study here in my lab, in Dr. Prokopi's lab, where we tried to understand whether people responded positively to a picture of a hellbender or this cartoon rendition of a hellbender. And this is help the hellbender, be a hero, help a hellbender, where we've obviously anthropomorphized this particular hellbender. And what we see with the hellbender is a lot of people like that rendition, that drawing, and not so much the actual picture of a hellbender. So uh, that's why we have two types of stickers uh, to really address both audiences. The people who really didn't like the picture of the hellbender were young. The people who really liked the picture of the hero were very young. And then we had tried to evaluate, we went back and evaluated all of those riparian landowners to see if all this education and outreach that we've been distributing in that local community has affected their overall knowledge. Uh, again, whether overall, whether you're a landowner, whether you're an angler, and in each case, we were able to really educate the public on the importance of hellbenders and what we want them to do. So if they were to catch a hellbender, they know to cut the line and not rip the hook out of its throat and things of that nature. So the last phase in finishing up is our restoration. And here we know that captivity, rearing individuals in captivity can deprive animals of natural stimuli. So this is what historically hellbenders were being reared in. These tanks with no flowing water, just a couple hide objects, but then they were being reintroduced into these very complex, very different habitats. So we wanted to see from a research perspective, are, things, are there things we can do with rearing hellbenders that will engage them in natural stimuli and help them survive to a higher degree once they're released. And we already knew we had 50% survival by rearing them this way. As our, can, if we change this and make it look more like this, can we increase their survivorship? So we started hitting cell hellbenders with moving water, predator cues, and, and, and natural river water to get them accustomed to the microbiota, um, the organisms, the microorganisms that live in the water. So just by advancing head starting by hitting these animals with, with water, you can see that we have almost 90% survivorship for about the first 200 days. And then we start seeing a little bit of mortality, uh, but it's still between 40 and 60%, but it's averaging now around 75%. So by advancing our head starting, we've increased the survivorship post-release from 1% from if you do nothing, 50% if you rear them in fish tanks, almost 80% if you really start changing the environment. We also started adding ink, uh, predator cues where we have bass in the top tank and we feed them the tiger salamander larvae and those caramones then flow into the tanks below. So it's essentially providing caramones, these predator cues in the water column to try to get hellbenders to behave accordingly. 
because what we found in these, these types of tanks is hellbenders just floated on top of the water. And that's not normal behavior for hellbenders. They're supposed to remain under rocks, under hides, and, and not move during the day. So there's our bass being fed. Uh, a tiger salamander larvae, it is not a hellbender, it's an endangered species, so we certainly wouldn't do that. And this is a great graph to show you the mean number of hellbenders on the y-axis and the observation. So these are how much hellbenders are, are moving. The dotted lines are unconditioned. The, the, the solid lines are animals that were conditioned. So you, you can see how much they're moving once the predators are introduced in the system. Those conditioned animals stop moving, okay, which is exactly what you want. This line is showing how the hellbenders are floating in the water. The dotted line are unconditioned. They never get predator cues. The solid line are, are, pre, are hellbenders that were receiving predator cues. And you can see they, the proportion of individuals that stay floating are unconditioned. Once you hit those hellbenders with predator cues, they recognize that there's a predator in the system and they stop floating and they go under a hide object and don't move. So we felt like we're really able to, to train these hellbenders to, to not be active when, when predators, particularly fish predators, because remember, predation is the number one cause of mortality in amphibians and reptiles, right? We taught you that in class, and so now we know that that's a factor. What can we do in the lab to minimize predation? So we've added moving water, we've added predator cues. The next thing we're doing is adding these two things together, and that's a research project that we're doing right now called a synergistic interaction study, and we're doing that this spring. Last couple of things I want to leave you with is uh, there's new state guidelines in the state of Indiana that if you're going to be doing conservation programs, particularly reintroductions, there's a set of guidelines that researchers and the state must follow in order for it to be approved uh, for a conservation program. And some of the things that should, I want you, I'm not going to read all of these, but there should be some things that we've talked about that will resonate with you that we've talked about in lecture. One, the life history trait of the species needs to be considered. Right? And how many times have we talked about this in lecture? You have to know the natural history. You have to know the life history, the biology of the species. You have to understand the release site. Uh, you have to understand the source populations, right? And we talked about that in the Hellbender Project. Disease risks of parasites. We talked about that in the, very, in the, the lecture we talked about earlier today. How are you going to be doing monitoring? And we talked a lot about how we've done that in my Hellbender project. How's it going to affect any socioeconomic issues? How's it going to impact the local community? And we addressed that with our outreach and education. And of course, are there any partners and what are their roles? And obviously, we've, we've got a great partner database with the Hellbender Conservation Program that we've, that we've adopted here and developed uh, with Purdue and IDNR. And I just want to leave you with a couple of things. One is to really again stress that it's an iterative process that you have to understand the biology. You can then start thinking about what ecology and management you wanna do. Then you can actually start restoring the population. But then we have this phase four, and this is something I haven't talked about, and this is habitat management. And that's where my program is right now. In fact, we just submitted a grant for $2.3 million uh, federal grant program where we could get over $2 million that will go to farmers so that they can start adopting conservation practices in the watershed where, where hellbenders live. So we've, we're addressing this final phase, which is how can we make sure that the habitat is, is as pristine as possible while still allowing farmers to grow their crops, but also minimizing the impact to the aquatic system, specifically hellbenders, to allow, allow them to thrive since this restoration is occurring. So we're, the jury's still out if I get that grant, we will be fully engaged in the next three years on phase four, which is employing $2.3 million worth of conservation practices on farm ground in the watershed. So that's a really exciting part as well. And the last thing I want to leave you with, again, if you're thinking about conservation biology, I want you to think about it from a, a much broader perspective. What part of conservation biology resonates perhaps most with you? Is it doing the, the more basic research or the applied research that I shared with you in, in today's lecture? Are you more interested in the education component that I shared and, and how we work with our partners to get that education out to the local communities? Maybe you're more interested in the land management, which I didn't talk a lot about because that's our final phase, but perhaps you're more interested in the habitat management component of conservation biology, or maybe more of the captive propagation or captive breeding component 
of restorations. So I think there's there's something in there for everyone. So again, now in, instead of saying you're interested in conservation biology, maybe you can say I'm interested in conservation biology, specifically X, Y, or Z. And that will help guide you as you think about your future career in natural resources. So let me start back up my video. And so with that, I really hope you enjoyed the course. I hope you found that you've learned a lot from day one uh, until day now, uh, learning through the natural history, taxonomy, ecology, and conservation. And I, and I really am uh, hopeful that uh, I'll get a chance to see you guys in the spring when we go to summer camp in person. But until then, stay safe, enjoy your holiday season, and we'll see you next time.